sunset, whatever time that might be, that particular time of, of the year. And if you lived in the area around Jerusalem, you might go to the temple at least for one of those times of prayer. And so that seems to be what Peter and John were doing as they headed to the temple for this three o'clock uh, time of, of prayer. They were creatures of habit. It was a good religious discipline they had uh, to pray during these times of the day, uh, and that seemed to be a part of their daily routine. But they weren't the only people that we're going to see in this passage today who had a regular routine. We read on in verse 2, and a man came, uh, a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. The scripture says this man had been lame from birth. He was unable to walk, and as we can imply from that, unable to earn a living for himself. And it seems that medical help for his problem that, that caused him to be unable to walk was unavailable. There was no cure. There was no solution for him. There likely wasn't the type of government disability or assistance programs that we have today. So he didn't have a lot of good financial alternatives other than begging. That was this man's total means of sustenance. And he, uh, he had folks who would carry him to the temple gates, and he figured that was the best place. He might have the best shot with the religious people coming in and out that maybe they would give him something that he could live off of. And this was his reality. This was his daily routine. It's likely, if we think about this as I have this week, that he had developed a mentality that comes with being totally dependent. I call it kind of a, a dependence mentality. Uh, maybe in the beginning it was embarrassing and humiliating to him to ask for help, to somebody to carry him to the temple gates, and then to ask continually all day for people to give him things that he needed to live off of. And once there, that was his daily, his daily ritual and routine. Uh, he was completely dependent upon others. And I imagine that after some time, he, he lost his, his aversion to that. The humility, he had already been humbled. He, it no longer bothered him. He was no longer ashamed to ask for help. He realized he had to or, or there was no other way forward. But perhaps I've wondered this week if maybe he felt some other emotions. I wonder if somewhere along the way, he, bitterness came in. Some anger crept in. That each time he watched these people walk into the temple, he thought, why is it that they walk into the temple? They walk out of the temple, but yet this is my lot in life. I, I've never walked a day in my life, and those people are just blessed just because they're blessed. And what's wrong with me that I didn't receive that blessing? Maybe he felt that because of this unfair situation that people owed him something, that the world owed him something, that maybe even God owed him something. I wonder if he ever felt resentment toward the people that walked by, these people living their normal lives, these people who have their independence, who can do and come and go as they please. Maybe he felt they were obligated to give me something because they have what I so desperately want. Now, that's a lot of conjecture on my part. I don't know if that's what he felt when he looked at Peter and John and asked them the same question he had asked, no telling how many times, day after day after day. It says in verse 3, seeing Peter and John go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. You know, there are desperate people and situations that some in the world today, if they're honest, don't like to think about. Um, they don't like to think about it because it makes them uncomfortable. It, it, it makes them see the world in a way that they don't want to see the world. What I'm talking about, I think sometimes we like to pretend that we live in a world where no one is starving. You know, when we're flipping the channels and we come across those, those infomercials that, that are telling us that there are people that will die because they don't have food while we are sitting worrying about how to lose weight and we're throwing away enough food to feed people in the world today. And we don't like to stop and watch those commercials because they mess with the way that we want to view the world. They make us uncomfortable. I think we like to pretend we live in a world where everyone has friends and, and family and people that are in their lives on a daily basis. So when we see the kid sitting by himself at the lunch table, we act as if we don't see him and we focus on the other side of the room 
because we don't like to imagine that. We don't like to think about the elderly people who live alone and have no one to visit them. It messes with the way we want to see the world, so we put it out of our mind. I, I think we like to pretend that we live in a world where everybody has a place to live, and so when we people sitting, see people sitting on sidewalks, holding signs, asking for spare change, we cross on the other side of the street to avoid them. It's easy to fashion a life for yourself, a worldview where you block these people out of your everyday life, out of sight, out of mind, right? You don't go to certain parts of town. You don't look in certain directions or acknowledge certain people or groups. I'm ashamed to say that even within the church, it's tempting to build a church where we isolate ourselves from those kind of folks, where we build comfortable environments, where we surround ourselves with people that, that look like us, that live like us, and we want to imagine that's just the way the world is. And we have worship services and Bible studies and fellowship events while we look the other way. But here's the thing, and I want to talk to you about today. Jesus looked right at them. Jesus looked at those situations and those people, and he saw them. As a matter of fact, many times, on, on many different occasions, Jesus said, it's those people that I came for. Matthew 9, 36, here, here's a good description of the heart of Jesus. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless and like sheep without a shepherd. And Jesus said, who's going to take care of them? I will. I see them. Jesus spent his years on earth seeing the people that many others chose not to see. He talked with the sexually immoral woman at the well when others would avoid her, when she would even come at a time of day when other people wouldn't be around because she was so ashamed of herself. Jesus said, I came for people like that. And he sat down and he talked with her about the living water. Jesus ate meals with sinners and tax collectors and the people that you weren't supposed to hang out with if you were well thought of in the community. Because he said, it's the sick who need a doctor, and I have the cure for what ails them. He, he knelt beside the adulterous woman when all of her accusers threw her into the center of town, ready to stone her to death. And Jesus said, that's fine, go ahead. But whichever one of you has never sinned, you throw the first stone. Because she just sins differently than you do. So be careful what you do. Jesus came and he touched lepers. As he healed them. He, he could have just spoken it, but he, he chose to touch them, to heal them. And I wonder how long it had been since some of those leprous people had been touched. But yet, that's what Jesus came to do. And perhaps because of the Spirit of God was within them, Peter and John got it right this day. They looked at this man. So many people probably had walked in and out of that temple, never looking his way, but they stopped. And I love what verse 4 says, and Peter directed his gaze at him. The Bible didn't have to point that out, but it does. As did John, it says. And then he said, look at us. Look at us. <laughs> I'd say this man had become accustomed to just looking at the ground and probably asking because he was humbled and he, he, he just didn't want to make eye contact with people. That's what life had done to him. But, but Peter and John stopped and they looked at him and they said, hey, look, look at us. Look us in the eye. You are our equal. Guys, let us determine today as followers of Christ to see people like that. To see people that are often overlooked by society. 1 John chapter 3 gives us this challenge. It says, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? May we always see the people that sometimes get overlooked. Now listen, I've thought about this this week in light of our church family. And, and I, I don't mean to heap guilt. That's not what I'm here to do. I think for the most part, we are a church that sees, a church that sees people. And I've thought of different ministries in our church. I've thought of different uh, people in our church that you're so good at seeing people. You're so good at picking people up and saying, no, look up, look, look at me because I'm seeing you and valuing people as God values them. So many of you go out of your way to assist those who are struggling, whether it's financially or in some other way. So many of you take time to visit those who are in prison, who are hospitalized, or who are shut in. So many of you are generous toward those who have needs. God bless you for that. I hope that we never lose that identity. As we go on today, I think there are two ways that we can help people who are in need. 
One, we can, it can be about supplying their immediate needs. We can give people some money, uh, or provide them with resources just to get them through another day. Sometimes that's the best way you can bless somebody. Now, now listen to me, Christians, please. There is a need for this type of assistance. I think sometimes today people get all upset and worked up over giving people handouts and we're saying, oh, that's just enabling people not to work. That's, you know, it's teaching them bad things. It's teaching them to depend upon others. Uh, Some claim it only enables things in their lives. But listen, the reality is this. There are people today who truly cannot provide for themselves. Don't ever fail to recognize that. Don't ever fail to see that due to legitimate Physical handicaps, some people cannot support themselves. Due to legitimate debilitating emotional challenges, severe depression or anxiety, there are people that cannot function every day and hold a job to support themselves. There are people that have limited mental abilities and cannot hold a job to support themselves. The Bible says there will always be people like that in this fallen world until Jesus comes and makes it all right and that we, the church, have a responsibility to care for those who cannot care for themselves. Deuteronomy 15 says, For there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy and to the poor in your land. May we always see them. May we always have hearts of compassion and mercy. And may Christians be the first to be known for having that heart. Furthermore, the Bible says the people of God should be known for our compassion and generosity to those who cannot help themselves. Secondly, I think we can also help people by removing the barriers so that they can be self-sufficient. And that's the part that this story focuses on today. In in verses 5 through 7, it says, And he fixed his attention on him, talking about the beggar, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and he raised him up and immediately his feet and his ankles were made strong. Now, there are people today who are in a a tough situation because they've got some challenges. They've got some obstacles that they didn't ask for that are holding them down. I think about the single mother with three children and her quandary is if she gets a job, then somebody's got to take care of her young children who aren't even in school yet. She doesn't have any family. She doesn't have any friends that are willing to keep those children or able to keep those children during the day. So if she puts them in daycare, the cost of the daycare for the three children is more than what she can make by working. So what's she supposed to do? I think of the family that's sinking financially because of a medical hardship and the breadwinner is medically not able to work and not only is his income not coming in, but now they've got all these medical bills on top of bills that are just weighing them down and they're desperate, they're scared, they don't know how to get out from under this situation. You know, when Peter and John stopped and they looked at this man, he likely thought, great, I finally found two guys willing to give me some money I can eat today. I can eat today. But what what he would come to realize is they were about to give him something that was of far greater worth than his next meal. Peter was about to bestow a blessing upon this man that would enable him not to eat just for a day, but to eat for the rest of his life. He didn't just give him the means to buy his next meal. In the name of Jesus and by the power of Jesus, he took away the barriers. He took away the burdens that were keeping him from providing for himself. Peter didn't just give this man a handout. He gave him a hand up to having a life where he could take care of himself. You know, as I look back on on my life, I'm thankful for the times that God didn't give me what I was praying for. Now, that might sound odd to say, but let me explain. We often pray and we ask God to fix a situation in our life. And we say, God, this is wrong in my life. Will you fix this? Will you take this away? And sometimes it seems like nothing is happening in response to our prayers. Sometimes we don't get what we're asking for because God's got a bigger agenda than what we're praying for. God's got something bigger and grander and better in mind than what we're praying for, and so we're not praying big enough. 
You know, many times I think there are situations where God could fix the problem at hand. He could deliver us from that situation or he could fix us. And he could change the whole path of our life and we wouldn't keep getting back in the situation. Do you follow what I'm saying this morning? Sometimes we're saying, God, will you just rescue me from this? Will you just fix this? And God says, nope, you're not praying big enough. I want to fix you so I don't have to keep rescuing you. And sometimes you're going to have to go down a different path with me. Let's give the Lord praise for all the times that he does that. But it throws us into this confusion for a while. We get angry sometimes. We go, God, why won't you do what I asked you to do? And you say that you're going to answer my prayers. And God says, I am answering your prayers. Sometimes God takes us on a journey. And many of his best fixes, his best restoration jobs, he has to take us into a wilderness. And it can be painful. It can be hard. And and what we were expecting is not what we get. And in that wilderness, he humbles us. He breaks us. And he reforms us into a different person, a better person. Has anybody here today ever been in the wilderness with God? That you asked for something and God says, oh, I'm going to do more than that. But we're going to go on a journey together. And it's going to take some time. And you're going to have to trust me. Even when you can't understand or fathom what I'm doing, well, I'll fix things. Sometimes we may get frustrated and bail out before we reach the end of the journey, and we never get to see the blessing of what God was trying to do. But those who hold on in faith, those who stay the course, can look back and see the value of the struggle. Now, I've got a few of these in my life that I can look back and say with James in James chapter 1, count it all joy, my brothers. When you meet trials of various kinds. In other words, thank you God for taking me to the wilderness. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. It's just as if when Peter and John reached up and they pulled that man up to his feet and says, Now you've got a greater gift than what you were asking for. Somebody here today may be frustrated with God right now. You may feel like he's not listening to your prayers because he's not doing what you've asked him to do. I just want to tell you, hold on in faith. Maybe that's what you came here today to hear. Just hold on in faith and trust that the way maker we sang about a while ago knows a little bit more about what you need than you know. He may be doing something far bigger than you realize. And instead of just fixing your situation, he is at work right now in fixing you and changing the course of your path forward. Stay faithful. Let him finish what he's doing because he who began a work in you is faithful to complete it. Amen? We must trust even when we don't understand. So I wonder if that man was briefly disappointed When Peter and John didn't hand him money that day, but he got something far greater. Verse 8 says, now that they've lifted him to his feet, it says, in leaping up, he stood and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Now, I I can't say this on the authority of Scripture that this is exactly how it was, but I like when I read these stories to not just read it over, but to try to picture it in my mind's eye. So will you you go with me here just a bit as I think about what it might have been like as we just kind of put some clues together, okay? This man had been lame from birth, the Scriptures say. He didn't know what it was like to stand on your feet, but here he is standing. For the first time in his life, we all have these moments that our parents are so proud of when we learn to stand on our own. You know, in those babies, they do that thing where you always put pillows around them because you don't know which way they're going, but but they're standing, and we're videoing it, taking pictures and all. He never had a moment like that. He is having that moment now, standing on his feet, uh, supporting his own weight. He's not sure how to balance himself. He's unsure of anything at that point. I imagine him standing there frozen for a moment, wondering if he was going to fall or collapse and make a fool of himself, but there he was. And then he dared to do something that he had never in his life done before. He was going to take a step, one step, everything's okay, another step, I'm still standing. 
his heart starting to pound in his chest and a third step and a fourth and with every step he gets more excited and now tears I just picture tears coming to his eyes as he never dreamed this was possible but now the impossible is possible in his life he is walking on his own and finally he even got so excited that walking wasn't enough and it says he got a little skip in his jump and he started leaping around and now that he got confidence he realized that he had indeed been healed and that life was never going to be the same and I just picture that he started doing that thing where you're you're crying but you're laughing at the same time and it's all the emotions coming out at once and it was so irreverent I'm sure right there in the temple gates he is just shouting he's skipping around looks like if you thought you didn't know what happened you'd have thought he lost his mind but he is just celebrating and praising the Lord in the midst can you imagine what Peter and John got to see that day as this man discovered the power of God in his life can I just say this? The church has no greater advertisement than transformed lives. The gospel of Jesus Christ has no better mouthpiece than to see your life transformed. I'm not talking about marketing so that, that we can build more attendance and have a bigger budget and all that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about gaining a hearing for the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no billboard, no 30-second uh, commercial you could put on TV, no greater advertisement than you living your life transformed. In this community, where people that have known you, we've talked before about the bad side of small towns where everybody knows your business and knows your past and everything you've done wrong, right? I'm talking about the opportunity for people that know all that stuff to see who you are today. And so, you know what? This person grew up with hate in their heart. They grew up with anger, and they were always in a fight, and everybody, nobody liked them growing up. But today, I had a conversation with them, and night and day, I couldn't believe who I was talking to. Glory to God. I knew this person when you couldn't, you couldn't trust them any further than you could throw them. But they are the most dependable worker I have in the place. And they are so honest. They have such integrity. Something has happened to them. And you can say, well, let me tell you what happened to me. His name is Jesus Christ. We have no greater advertisement than transformed lives. And I, that's the, the most satisfying part of the job that I have the privilege of doing here is watching Jesus Christ transform lives week in and week out and watching the growth that takes place. There's times when, when I come home from my Wednesday night life group and I'll just tell my wife, I am so proud of so-and-so because I can just see them from week to week growing and the difference that, uh, from our men's group on Sunday nights and watching these guys say, I want to leave my home. And I don't know what I'm doing completely yet, but I'm going to try. And I want to pray for my wife. And I want to love my children like that. And it just excites me to see God transform people's lives. And there's no better advertisement than the Holy Spirit of God on the move doing what only he can do. Well, this healed beggar, he realized that the source of his healing was not Peter. He didn't turn up and start praising Peter. He, 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 he said he continued walking in amazement and he started praising God in, in verses 9 and 10. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they recognized him as the same one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple. That's that guy that sits down there begging every day, they were saying, asking for alms. And they were filled with the wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Everybody is witnessing this. This is what everybody in town is going to be talking about right here at the 3 o'clock prayer time at the temple. It's something, if something good is happening in your life, folks, tell somebody about it. Tell somebody about what God is doing in your life. And, but let's tell them this. Don't say the Carpenter's Christian Church changed my life. Don't say that. Don't say something that Greg Warren said changed my life. Don't Please don't say that. Don't say a visit from John Kessel changed my life because I know what John would say. He would point to the one who changed your life. Amen? His name is Jesus. Tell his story. Tell what he has done. Always point people toward the real Savior. We want to tell the people of this community uh, about Jesus Christ and how he can save anybody. And his is the only name you need to know. Long after you forget who preached that message, who sang that song, who prayed for you, remember the name of Jesus. You know, one of my favorite people, and some of you all may know him. He comes to church here pretty often. He has to have folks come and get him and bring him here. And his name's Chester. 
And Chester, he lives out at the Willows. He's in a wheelchair. And he has to wear a helmet because of some damage he's had to his, his skull. And if you know Chester, he's an awesome dude. And he loves to tell you, and he has a hard time talking. But if you listen to him, you can understand what he's saying. And Chester will say, look what, look what, and he'll show you with his hand. He can now control parts of his hand. He can get up. He can walk a little bit for short periods of time. He's had a long road, but he doesn't sit there bitter in that chair. He finds reasons to praise God that every day he's getting a little bit stronger than the day before. Here's what I love about Chester. Chester will show you how much progress he's making. And then if he, without fail, I've never had him show me this. He didn't say it. He'll say, Jesus, Jesus. And I'm sure there are therapists and doctors and all kinds of treatments that he's had to get to that point. And I'm sure he's grateful for them. But he knows where his healing comes from. And if you listen to him very long, Chester will tell you as he points to the sky. And he just tells you about Jesus. You know, whenever God answers a prayer, does something amazing in your life, be sure to give him thanks. Thank the people that he did it through and show your gratitude. But make sure you know from where the glory came. From heaven itself. Listen, we're a church that believes in the power of prayer. That's why at the end of every service, we invite you to come and either pray here in the front or to step into the prayer room. We've got folks that will pray with you over a need in your life. I believe with all my heart that prayer changes things. And prayer should be a part of our worship as we see what God does in our midst. But listen to me. A praying church also must be a testifying church. A praying church must also be a testifying church. May the invitation time also be a time where we can come and receive Christ, but we can also come and just say, I'm not asking for anything today. I just want to tell you what my God did. I just want to tell you what his prayers have done in my life. And may we come and publicly praise God. Now, you can pray in your own prayer life, and I think we should, and I hope that you are. But there's something about standing in the temple, standing in his house, and telling what God has done in your life. Psalm 105 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. If God has been good to you, if God has answered a prayer in your life, my challenge to you this week is go tell somebody. Tell somebody, whether it's here today or whether it's in your home, that you tell your family what God has done and how he's answering prayers and moving in your life. But give God the glory. One, because it glorifies and pleases our God. That's the main reason to do it. Here's another reason. It builds the faith of other people. Listen, church, there is, there is another generation that desperately, what? Absolutely. Absolutely. Come up here. As he's coming, I'll tell you, there is a generation of young people that need to hear about the goodness and the reality of God and the power of prayer. Go ahead, brother. So uh, it, many of you don't know me. I moved here about five years ago from Japan, uh, from Danville, but the uh, military took me uh, various places. I have two children. I'm sorry to take up your time, but this is important. Um, both my children were born and raised in Japan, and uh, we moved here five years ago. Uh, my son uh, actually got baptized here uh, thanks to uh, the wonderful work of Jacob. But uh, so my son followed my footsteps and joined the Marine Corps, and uh, I watched every process. We hear the stories about recruiters. I was there with him every step of the way, uh, making sure that things were aligned. And so uh, it was our intent to try to get him, he's fluent in Japanese, to uh, get him a job in the Marine Corps using his Japanese and hopefully be stationed in Japan. So uh, we, uh, we, uh, everything was on track. And then, so when he finished boot camp, they sent him to the school. They said, well, this school is, uh, 
uh, full. They sent him to another one. It was going downhill. And then uh, he, they put him on a train. The train hit a tree, uh, had changed in the locomotive. Uh, it was just one thing after the other. It was just going down. And then the, uh, he was basically going to end up getting a job just blowing things up. And uh, I felt as a father that uh, I, I did everything that I could to ensure that uh, he would have a good future and everything was falling apart. And uh, but uh, so I contacted the recruiter. I contacted Louisville. Uh, I was reaching out to various people, doing everything I could. And then. My hands were tied, and I thought, well, there's nothing I could do. And then I started praying. And uh, so even at work, at home, um, in the hallway, as I was, uh, as I was walking, as I was sitting, I was just praying. And so uh, I don't know, well, God told me to. I didn't give up. I wrote a lengthy um, email, and I thought, you know, I've got to do something. And um, so there's a place called Headquarters Marine Corps, and it's probably almost as big as the Pentagon, and there are over 2,000 people that work there. And I got online, and I thought, I'm going to send a message. You know, this should not have happened to my son, everything that he's going through. I won't tell you the full story, but it was not his fault. It was just... Uh, uh, a lot of misunderstanding and paperwork, and, and things were look, starting to look bad. And so uh, when I, so I wrote up an email, not even knowing who I'm going to send it to. And then I got on the email, uh, the internet, and I checked headquarters Marine Corps, and there were, must have been 20, 30 pages of people, contact information. Uh, some of the departments, offices, I didn't even know what they meant, and I'm former Marine. So uh, after about 20 minutes, I almost gave up. I went to the restroom, and, I'm, and as I'm walking, I'm, I'm like, you know, God, please help me. I came back. I scrolled down to the next page, and it said, Officer, um, Officer uh, Comptroller, and that's the person who decides where you go and what you do in the military. I scrolled down the next page and said, Enlisted Comptroller. I clicked on that page. There must have been 20 people on that page. I scrolled down, and I selected one person, and I sent the message. Before I sent it, I was like, God, please don't get my son in trouble. Please don't let me get my son in trouble. And I sent it. Five minutes later, I was like, can I recall that message? You know, what have I done? I'm just going to make things worse. And um, the next day, I got an email from a Master Sergeant Dunn. And the first thing he asked me was, uh, why did you send this to me? And I thought, I've definitely got my son in trouble. Um, and, uh, and I said, sir, I said, uh, and he said, you know, there are over 2,000 people or 2,500 people working here at headquarters Marine Corps. Why did you send this to me? And I asked, I basically said, God told me to. And he said, well, he said, uh, that's amazing because he said, Mr. Smith, when I read your email, it was like reading a story about his own family. He also lived in Japan for 15 years, and I've never met this man before in my life. And again, out of 2,500 people, I selected one person. He was also in the Marine Corps. He also lived in Japan for 15 years. He also has a son and a daughter that was born and raised in Japan, and his son graduates uh, this year and will also be going into the Marine Corps. And... Um, and uh, he's also a Christian, and we had uh, a great conversation over the phone about how God answers prayers. And uh, so now uh, they have fixed the situation, and my son will continue as a United States Marine and uh, become a military police. And uh, not only that... Uh, I mentioned in my email that one of the reasons we wanted my son to get stationed in Japan was right before we moved here. His mom is Japanese. She's still in Japan. And uh, she was uh, diagnosed with cancer. Uh, and uh, they removed it, but we're still concerned because cancer runs in her family. And uh, we were concerned, you know, about uh, him being away for so long. We wanted him to get stationed there. So not only is he going to 
become a military police, they said, we are going to ensure that your son gets stationed in Okinawa, Japan, uh, and he will live within three minutes of where his mom is. Amen. Can we give God so. praise for that this morning? Amen. Thank you for sharing, brother. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Couldn't have a better illustration as, of what I want to talk about as we close. Guys, we need people in our generation, church, hear me, that will tell this next generation that's being told all the time there is no God. Prayer is a waste of time. It's only for, for people that, that need a crutch that there is a living God, that prayer is our link to the God of the universe and that he cares about the needs of his people and that as we sang today, God is always working. He's always moving. Just as in this situation today, this next generation needs to hear that in the church. Psalm 78 says, we will not hide them from their children, but tell the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. So thank you for sharing that. It's important, young people, listen to me. I, this is the last thing, and I'm closing, I promise. Young people, we hear all the time about how this millennial generation, how this next generation coming up is, we, we're worried, we're wringing our hands, we don't know what we're going to do about them. But listen, I know different because I know some of the people in this church family, and we need the encouragement coming up. For I love to see young people who could be all the places they could be on a weekend, but they choose to be in the Lord's house. That motivates me. It encourages me about the future to see our children's ministry here, our student ministry here. And I know that we've got some young people committed to living for the Lord. And we need to hear from that generation. The older generations need that encouragement. Listen to 1 Timothy. Don't let anyone think less of you because you're young, but be an example to all believers, not just your age group, in what you say, in the way you live, in your love, your faith, and in your purity. We need young people to testify and say, we're not all into all that stuff. There's some of us that love the Lord and we're committed to him with our whole heart for the rest of our lives. May this be a place where we testify of all that the Lord has done, of how he's on the move and how he's working, not just back in Bible times, but in 2020 in our generation today. Let's pray. God, we thank you, first of all, for seeing us. For seeing us, Lord, I am nobody. But God, because of Jesus, you've made me a somebody. And I'm thankful that I matter to you and that when I pray, you hear my voice and you care about the things that I care about. And, and you care about uh, young men that are enlisted in the Marines, God, and, 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 and maybe not going to be where they should be. But when we pray, it can change things, God, and you will guide our steps and, and direct us and order us. You care about every marriage in this room. You care about every parent-child relationship. You care about every financial situation. You are a God who sees and cares. And God, you've answered so many prayers that have been lifted up here in this place, in that prayer room, in our homes, God, in all the, the ways that we find ourselves through the week. May we just say thank you. May we tell somebody this week, this very day, what you've done. We love you, Lord. We could never thank you enough. Just accept this today when I say praise be your name forever. Thanks for healing us, Lord. Thanks for being our provider our strength, our daily source of comfort. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ, here's your opportunity to come and profess his name and make him the Lord of your life. You'll never regret that decision. If you'd like to join this church family, we welcome you. And we'll begin that process with you today. Now, whatever your need may be, won't you come as we stand and sing?